make, make sure you're comfortable and uh, there's plenty of room spread out here and if you sit kind of down towards the front that might help after a while we go over the slides and make sure you have a booklet if you don't have a booklet we've got some more for you um, there's several in the seats out there already um, one per couple or if you need two that's fine I've got extras and uh, we're glad you're here in the faith of the family finance session today and great host coming in here this second session Got a little nervous there in the beginning. I had about six or eight people, and I thought, whoa. Um, but now everybody's coming, so it's wonderful. So glad you're here. I'm going to open with a word of prayer, and then we'll get started today. I just want to introduce my wife. She's sitting down front here. I'm Charlene. We've been married 40 years next month on March the 8th. Um, uh, we met um, September the 7th, 1980, on a Sunday evening at the Longwood Bible Baptist Church over in Longwood, Florida, near Orlando. And... I was out of Bible College. I had come out of Tennessee Temple where Dr. Robertson and Dr. Faulkner and of course Dr. Sexton were. And, and there I looked back at the pew and it was on that side, almost to the very back in the center, and I saw this blue-eyed, blonde-headed young lady. That's what I prayed for. I said, Lord, can I have blue eyes and blonde hair? <laughs> and in the dorm, in the Martin dorm at Tennessee Temple. And uh, it's kind of a silly prayer, you know, but God, God answered my prayer and there she was. And, uh, we met September the 7th, and um, uh, six months later we were married. We've been married for 40 years now. And a lot to do with finance that we're going to study today, I learned from her. And from her disciplines growing up in her family, and we'll deal with that and some of the tools. So let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this session. Thank you, Lord, we can come together as couples, and we can study your word, and, and we can learn how to be better stewards and uh, use the resources you give to us together to work together for your glory and for the gospel's sake. For it's in Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. In the book of Genesis, we find the first account. And by the way, in finance, we're dealing with the husband and the wife together. It's a couple. It's not one or the other. It's together as a couple. And so I want you to see here in the Bible. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And as Dr. Pope so eloquently explained it last night, God is here. Husbands here, wives here, we're growing spiritually closer to God and closer to one another. And that is one spirit, one soul, and one body together. Therefore, the resources that come into that family and that relationship belong to God, and they're to be managed together, in harmony together with one another. And that brings about the second point. If you look in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, for just a moment, and about verse 21, in Ephesians 5 and verse 21, the Bible says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. We submit ourselves one to another in the fear of God. That's in the marital relationship and everything that goes along with that, which includes, by the way, all the finances in the relationship. The number one cause of divorce in the United States is finance, mismanagement in the home. That's where the breakup occurs. And so it's a very delicate subject, but a very important one, one that cannot be ignored. And we'll deal with that today. I wonder how many savers do we have in the room, in your relationship? How many savers do you have? My wife raised her hand. I'm not. She's the saver. How many spenders do we have in the room? All right, I'm a spender. So we'll, we'll show you how to spend and be careful and, and not upset the saver and at the same time move forward. So we'll deal with that in a little while as we go through. Number two is this word agreement. When we see submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God, that's in agreement by the Holy Spirit's power. So God can use you. Now turn with me back to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8. We're going to look at one verse there. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18. Probably not a well-known verse to many of us, but a very important verse. Verse 18 says in Deuteronomy 8, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he sware to thy fathers, as it is in this day. Wealth is given to a married couple to be used for God's glory. Their marriage relationship is a picture of the church. All the resources that come into that relationship are to be used for the gospel's sake, right? For the children and for the ministries they're involved in. So your whole entire life as a Christian is living for the gospel. Right. All the finance, all the rewards, all the wealth, all of it belongs to God. You're just a steward of it, but he's given you dominion over it. And so therefore, if you can learn to communicate together, you can become a very powerful couple with your resources. 
And we'll show you in a little while how that works and how God can use you to be a blessing in the church. See, Israel had forgotten. They had forgotten. Verse 10 says, When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Verse 11, Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and statutes which I command thee this day. Verse 12, Lest when thou hast eaten and are full and hast built goodly houses and dwell therein, and when your herds and your flocks are multiplying and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that's multiplied, then verse 14 happens. Then thy heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of Bonnet. So we see that God is the source of our life and our wealth and everything to do with it, our happiness and our wholeness, and working together as Christians in God's power with the resources he gives us. And so what does that precipitate? If you took, turn to the book of Colossians for just a moment, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, chapter 3, and verse 24. I've not seen this before until recently in studying this passage, but in Colossians 3.24, the Bible says, knowing that, and by the way, up above, it deals with husbands and wives and children. All that's part of this chapter. In verse 1, it's talking about being risen with the Lord. And you then be risen with the Lord. Seek those things which are above. That's the problem we have here in the United States, having a $22 trillion gross domestic product, is because our, money, our eyes are on money and on possessions and on things. They're not, our affections become put on possessions and on things. And then we start valuing people on money between us and comparing them based on their wealth. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. Because, by the way, we're joint heirs with the King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who's created all things and owns all things. That's who we belong to. Right. And in your relationship, if you'll put that there, this comparing to one another goes away, and then God gets the glory, and he can bless you. All right? You can do it. Knowing this... That of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. That's the husband in the rightful position as the head of the family, the wife in submission to the Lord and to her husband. That's mutual submission to one another in the Lord. Notice you never get far from the Lord. <laughs> he's always right in the center of it all, and he's the one that can make all things beautiful in his time, as the Bible says. He'll keep us and he'll hold us. So we have to have a plan. Because if we learn in Deuteronomy 8.18, we're establishing a covenant. So that means the gospel's involved with your resources. And by the way, you only live here for maybe 90, 95, or 100 years, maybe a little bit more. Maybe get put in a smucker's jar if you get over 100 years of age. But I'm telling you, you live for eternity with God. And how much are you going to send ahead? Invest into missions. Invest into eternity. You know, how, how much are you going to send ahead for the glory of God that actually results in the gospel and the salvation of the lost? Well, that determines how you live. And by the way, you can live a joyful life being filled with the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, all of that. And the resources go with that, that you produce, that God gives to you. He actually entrusts you with resources. And there are many characters in the Bible that had a great deal of resources. Job and Joseph and Abraham. You can go all the way through Scripture, and God blessed people. But what do they do with those resources? They worshiped God, and they gave to God, and they gave offerings, and they served the Lord. And their lives were in balance because they put God for the Adam and Eve in the garden when God gave them everything. In the very beginning, the planet, the solar system, and everything were given to our original parents. And they were given all those resources and allowed to be free to have dominion over them. Okay? Now they fell, and they sinned against God, but the Lord sent a Redeemer. Right? And that same Redeemer that lives in your heart and in mine, the Holy Spirit, by God's power, through Christ and through the Father, all together, is the center and the core of our being. So never let anything become, in your mind, more valuable than that. Right. That's the beginning point. And then you together, work together in mutual submission, helping one another. I've had to learn this over 40 years um, next month. And some of you may be married longer, some less, but 40 years of marriage and experience. And when we got married, I had no credit. I was a banker and I had no credit. I was brand new at it, worked in the church. My wife had perfect credit and had learned from her family how to save and how to spend and how to budget and all those kinds of things. And we really wouldn't have anything today if it wasn't for her and her disciplines. And then I caught up to those things later as we learned along the way. But I was very thankful for that. It all started when I won a Sears and Roebuck Craftsman Toolbox one Christmas. And I couldn't afford to buy it. And uh, I didn't have any credit, and she had all the credit. 
and she had a Sears account. <laughs> and so one day we, she, we bought the toolbox and we paid it off and um, she always paid it off and we didn't pay interest. And then one day I called the credit bureau and you could do this many years ago. And I said, my wife has good credit because I was loading the credit bureau in the bank. I, I loaded it for people who didn't pay their bills. And um, those that paid them didn't pay them. And I said, I have no credit, how can I get some? Well, back then, they said, were you married? I said, yes. They said, well, we can make your credit joint if it, your wife will get permission. So I went from zero, zero <laughs> to having a 850 beacon score or a perfect credit score, you know, because of my wife and, and doing joint. I don't think you can do that today anymore. But um, anyway, I was very thankful that God uh, led me to a very wonderful person, a very disciplined person. And I tell the young Bible college students that when I'm teaching them these subjects to look for that kind of wife, you know, that's very frugal and um, so forth. Anyway, so now let's move on from there and take a look. And I gave you a handout, and I'm going to step to that handout for a moment. And I'm going to go to the back page, all the way to the back. You'll turn all the way to the back. It says Suggested Percentage Guidelines for the Family. So I want you to hold your place there. All right? And then I want you to look up here at the slides, and we're going to walk through some slides. And then we'll come back to this booklet, all right, and help you with these things. Number one, do you have a budget for your household? That's a rhetorical question unless you feel led to do it, to say something. Do you have a budget for your household, all right? Number two, have you created it together? Is it a joint budget? It should be a joint budget discussed, well discussed, well worn pencil and paper somewhere or computer or spreadsheet on this budget. Number three, is it reasonable and obtainable? And I'm going to walk you through a budget and show you how it works and break it all down for multiple income levels and uh, you'll be able to see that here in a little while. How often do you update your family budget? You know, you communicate with one another, you tell each other you love each other and you take each other out for dinner in various places and things like that, but do you sit down and have a money talk? Do you open up your budget and talk about it and communicate with one another to develop an agreement with one another as to what's going on in your relationship? Very important. And the last one, what do you do when you miss your budget? What happens when you miss the budget? Do you even know <laughs> you miss the budget and what happens? Usually it's a pretty upsetting experience. You know, if you get an overdraft in your checking account, you ever got an overdraft in your checking account? I shouldn't have to, so I shouldn't have to raise your hand. But um, uh, by the way, you can cure that by opening up a savings account and attaching it to the checking account. You can do that, you know, in, in case you miss a, a number or a digit. But anyway, um, be careful with that. So if you miss your budget, what do you do? Do you blow up all of the house, scream and holler, kick the wall, kick the tires? You know, what's going on there? That's, that's an indication you know, there's an issue inside your, your heart spiritually in that area, and we want to deal with that. So we're going to take a scalpel out here in just a moment and walk through some things with you that will help you with that, all right? I want you to be able to smile and uh, leave this, uh, these halls here with the understanding of a balanced budget and, and harmony and peace in your home and family. That's my, that's my dream in this. Number one, this is why you should have a budget. Number one, it stops overspending. You don't have a budget, you're going to overspend. Maybe you ever go to a ball game, like a basketball game, a big arena, or a football game, or anything like that, and then you go down to the concession stand and you take out a credit card and you buy things. Studies show that when you use a credit card, you spend more money than when you use cash. And so you have to be careful with these things when you're in that environment. Number one, stop overspending. It stops it. Number two, it helps you reach your goals. Just like you have goals for your children and your family and your home, you should have goals for your budget. You should have goals for the resources God's going to give to you, short-term and long-term goals. You should, if you're a young couple, you want to be balancing out the, the nucleus of that family and that home and creating a safe place to raise children and so forth. If you're on the other end of that spectrum, you're preparing for retirement. If you're like me, you're preparing for that, getting ready for that. And so we're going to walk through some of those things to help you with that. Number three. It helps you save money when you budget. And you'll see that here in a few moments. Number four, this is very important. This is really important. It helps stop worrying. <laughs> and you can enjoy the money God's given to you more. It stops the worrying and scurrying and flurrying and 
all of that unknown agitation that keeps you up at night. And it keeps that fric gets rid of that friction between the two of you. All right, they can occur. Number five, it allows you to be flexible. When was the last time you were in church and there was a missionary that came and had a special project and needed some kind of a gift and you really wanted to give them something, but you didn't have it? In other words, you hadn't prepared your budget well enough to have extra in there to do something special for someone that God lays on your heart. This will help you do that. Number six, this is really important, it puts you in control together. It puts you in control of your finances together. Not just one person, you know, spending wherever, not communicating with the other one, and then your accounts are overdrawn, your bills are past due, right? Can't put food on the table, all those kinds of things. Very important. And then number seven, it can be simple. It's a very simple thing to budget. It's not difficult at all. It's just simple math. It's not rocket science. We walk through it very simply. The key is just having the discipline to do that and work your way through it. All right, so here's some tips for financial finance now. A few tips. And by the way, she has a lot more tips. Ladies, after the meeting's over, she can give you a lot of tips on, on, on all this from the, the little ones all the way through and how to deal with that financially. But number one, discuss your finance. Communicate. Communicate with one another. All right? Probably if my wife would tell me anything, is I don't communicate enough. We, you know, science tells us that they get 15 to 20,000 words a day. In men, somewhere around 10,000 words. All right? It's an, on average. But communicate with them. Talk to them. Set some goals together. And all this is together. It's not separate. It's together. Manage your bank accounts. Your bank accounts should be joint accounts. The money should flow together. It shouldn't be separate. All right? They should be together. And then it gets balanced. And then your budget, you discuss it. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Chalk out a budget. And in this course here that we're dealing with here, I'm going to help you do that. All right? But chalk out a budget. Either write it down, text it, whatever however you want to do it. But put a budget down that you both are talking about communicating with one another. And I'll help you with the categories here in just a few moments that help you with that. And then you set monetary goals once again after you've chalked out a budget. All right? And this budget is a living document that changes. As your circumstances change financially, it changes. So you have to be aware of it. And then get together to save money. Have meetings regularly and talk about the blessings God's given you, these resources, and what you can do with them. I have this real happy church member that comes to the college all the time. I'm the VP of Finance at the college, CFO, so I deal with all the scholarship funds. And he's always whistling and coming into the building. And, and I'm not going to give a name, but suddenly he's got a check in his hand from some investment retirement account, and he wants to give it to the scholarship fund to help some children in the school that need help. And he, he does it quite often. He just smiles and whistles and <laughs> comes in the building. I'm very happy to see him. And I uh, can load that scholarship fund and then put it out to the kids and things like that. You want to get to that place in your life where it's a happy experience, not just a dreadful thing that you never want to look at or talk to. And then you take the right amount of risk on your budget. And we'll deal with that in investments here in just a few moments. You create an emergency fund. Always have an emergency fund. I recommend at least three months in a savings account of your operating expenses. Three months worth of your operating expenses. So if you've got $10,000 a month in operating expenses, every bill, have $30,000 set aside in a reserve account. It'll do wonders for you in terms of your peace of mind. You can set aside a reserve. If it's one month, do one month for the, for the present time, and then work your way up. If you're a young married couple, make it $1,000 and start there, and just set aside some funds that you can invest. I'm going to help you with investments here in just a few moments. Um, and then the last one is trust each other. Trust each other with the financial resources. Learn to communicate. Learn that you know one may be smarter than the other. I heard about that, fellas, in the other meeting. And in this case, I'm married to one that's smarter than I am in these areas of finance, so I have to listen. And she'll say, she'll caution, you know, that mutual submission, say, oh, let's don't spend. Oh, let's, let's don't do that right now. Oh, we're getting close to overseeing the budget, you know. And she checks it on the phone. She can track me on the phone to the bank. When I'm using the debit card at the bookstore at the college, and I bought a candy bar or something, you know, I'm getting it. She'll see a trend, you know, uh, of chocolate milk and candy bars and, and Dunkin' Donuts coffee or something. Just, oh, here it goes. And she'll know I'm on a roll. So I'm... Um, Caffeine kicks in, look out. If you're an impulse 
spend her, it picks up. So anyway, just teasing. But no, she does do that very thorough. And so I recommend to you to learn to communicate with one another and to trust each other. All right, trust. There's nothing I, I let her know everything. She knows everything we're doing. After all these years, is every bit of the investments, all the properties, we did five properties and sold them. Every investment in the stock market, I've got everything that's out there, she's aware of. And by the way, sometimes I'm at lunch with her, and I'll take out a napkin. I've done this in a little while, I'll probably need to update it. And I'll pencil out a financial statement. And I'll put the things we own, and the totals, and I'll put the things we owe, and the difference is our net worth. Which, by the way, I'll show you that in a minute in this book. But I show her from time to time, and gentlemen, by the way, that gives them peace of mind. When you've got everything in order like that, and reserves are in order, the bills are paid, and uh, everything's under control, they'll just settle down and be so calm about that. And that's important for you to do that every now and then. Let them see that you're genuinely interested in that. All right? So I put these slides in here, and I'll give out some business cards, and I can email these to you um, because of the detailed information. But marriage works upon honesty. So discuss your finances. All right? Set the goals. And it's never too late from the beginning of your marriage to the middle of your marriage um, to the latter years of your marriage to sit down and discuss goals in economics, what's going on. You're coming out of a, a really powerful economy that was upset by a virus. Prior to that, we had, a, we had a horrible recession that we came through. And now we went into a point of, of economic prosperity. And the markets are crazy. I'm generating about 20% returns on mutual funds. Um, so they're, they're, they're crazy. If you know where to put the funds there, then I'll show you some of that here in just a few moments. So the idea there is to have a document, have control, and have balance, and build that wealth that God's given you to be distributed for his glory, okay? And then manage your accounts together, as we said a moment ago. Chalk out a budget periodically. You know, write it out, chalk it out, get it right. I was running some mathematics the other day because I'm 65 years old now. So I got Medicare Part A. <laughs> and Part B, I don't have just yet because I've got health insurance because I'm still employed full time. But I, I ran through the mathematics. You need to be able to, if you're getting ready to retire, you should have about income generating at least 75 to 80% of what you're currently earning before you step into retirement. At least 75 to 80%. So if you're making 100000 a year, just as a number, you should be able to have investment vehicles around 75000 a year. Okay, in that area, and liquidated all of your debt. Vehicles paid off, credit cards paid off, everything paid off, and be able to step into retirement there like that. Today, if you're going to retire comfortably, today, if you step down to retirement, you need about $500,000 in an investment account today. Social Security has about 15 more years before it burns, and they're going to have to do something about it, all right, before they start cutting it and whittling it back. When Social Security was built originally, it was designed to last five years. The lifespan of people when it was built, they lived five years beyond retirement, typically. Now we live 15 and 20 years beyond retirement. That's why Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security are all being impacted. You had 18 paying into one drawing out when it was built. Now it's almost a one-to-one -one relationship. And you've got 75 million baby boomers today, all right, that are ready to retire in that zone out of a population of 360 million. We have more retirees than ever in the history of the United States getting ready to retire and go into the Medicare, Medicaid, if they need that, Medicare, and then into the Social Security pooling of funds. So all that's ahead of us, but you would need at least a half million in an account today. Now, if you want to be super comfortable, you've got a million, but a half million would work for you, all right? And by the way, in the United States, very few have even 100,000 today. They're ready to retire. Those are the statistics and the numbers. So we want to help you with that. We're just going. So chalk out the budgets. Save money often. Talk to each other. Measure the right amount of risk. You have dreams when you're a young couple starting out. You'd like to have a home. Maybe you're renting an apartment. You'd love to have a home. So you're trying to build up a savings account so that you can put the down payment on that house. Interest rates now on 15 years are about 2%. 30 years are 2.375. So depending on who you use. So the cost of money is, is extraordinarily low. And you can earn anywhere from 16 to 20% in mutual fund markets. And so it makes sense to keep your investments there and keep your mortgage there and keep it low. All right? You have a, there's a lot of room to work today. So you can invest in things. Um, you go beyond the honeymoon, and then you get a little bit further down the line with children in the home, raising children. 
setting aside, paying for their education. We did that for three kids, paid their way through college. They're married now. We had to sacrifice and we had to budget that, and we'll deal with that here in a few moments in this other document. And then finally, we said trust each other and work together. Learn to trust each other. Now, if you look at what I asked you to do just a moment ago, and um, suggested percentage of family guidelines, this is for a family of four children. A family of four. And so if you'll take a look, there are 14 items. On the left side, all the way down, you'll see 14 different items. It starts with tithing and giving. And by the way, this, this particular, um, this particular uh, guideline and set of guidelines was built by Dr. Larry Burkett originally. Have you ever heard of Dr. Larry Burkett? Before there was ever David Ramsey, who was bankrupt at the time, there was a Dr. Burkett that taught him over the radio and bailed him out and got him moving in the right direction. But Dr. Burkett built this and it's been tested over 50 years and it works. So I, I recommend it to you. And anybody that does any financial planning uses these tools like this and takes, takes a portion of this. So we have tithing and giving, first of all, at 10% or more than your taxes. Now this adjusts based on the state you're living in. If you have state income tax and then the federal income tax changes. Notice the household incomes from 25,000 to 125,000 from left to right. So there's your gross incomes. Now what I'd like you to see is when you get down to housing, that's the very first one, number three, notice that it's anywhere from 32 to 38% of your net spendable income. That's after tax, after tithing, net spendable income, housing is your largest single expense. And by the way, it's initially your largest investment. If you move from a rental to ownership, and by the way, I don't know if any of all of you own real estate and sold it in the last three or four years. I've made a killing, you know, in the last um, three or four years. Just unbelievable returns on real estate. Now that comes and goes, but your initial investment as a young couple will be your home. So your housing takes a large chunk of your disposable or what we call net spendable income. Then notice next, food. Got to eat. Got to feed the family and, and so forth. And we're going to talk about ways, if you're out of line with this budget, how you can fix it, too. Transportation, automobile loans, cars, buses, whatever transportation you're using, insurance, your debts, if you have any debts minimally, until we can get out of them. I'm going to show you some tools for that. Entertainment, recreation, clothing, savings, health and wellness, miscellaneous, investments, and notice as you get a little bit more income, you have more room to invest as the higher the income goes. And then number 14 is your school or child care expenses, which today you have two people working usually out of the home and the children are in a child care environment like that. We have two daughters and one of our daughters has two sons and she works um, in the banking world and her husband works. And so this is a part of their regular budget that they have to set aside. If you put your kids in Christian day school or private college, this will be a part of your allocation for your budget. Now, this allows for you to live within a budget within ratios and within percentages, okay? And that's, people ask me that often. What should it be? What's, what's the benchmark? Well, here's some benchmarks for you. Now, take the same document and go back to the first page. And as you go back to the first page, flip it beyond debt list and variable to estimated spending plan. All right, that's about the... Second page, on the back side of the second page, estimated spending plan. There are 14 categories here, the same 14 that were on the back page, okay? So at the top, you would put your gross monthly income in, break it down by salary, interest, dividends, take out the ties and taxes, and then you have your housing, and, you, and look at everything in that housing category. Now, you all appreciate that. When I'm teaching 18-year-olds finance at the college that just come out of their homes, they, this is an eye-opener for them. I said, this is what your parents have been doing for you <laughs> all this time. You get ready, this is getting ready to be yours here before long. So it's quite an eye-opener for these 18 to 22-year-olds in the college. But anyway, you all understand these things. And then the food, transportation, insurance, notice all 14 items are here. So if your budget's out of bounds, like we looked at here, where would you go to correct it? Where would be one of these items that you would go to to correct it? In other words, the money's not there, you can't spend it. So what would you do to adjust something? Yes? Clothing. Clothing, all right. So we can all shop 
Now I'm married to one of the thriftiest shoppers that all orders everything online. She buys the, the sale, she'll go to Carm or wherever it's at and find just exactly what's, you know, instead of buying something off the shelf. Another secret for you on this thing in the malls is wait till the sales are passed, you know, and the seasons are about to change, and then wait till the end of the month. And then you can go in, and you're not gonna be like the people that came and bought the first thing off the rack and paid way beyond the value of that thing. Um, you'll get something comparable, but at a much lesser price. There's ways to do that, and lots of tips for saving. What else would you do if your budget was out of balance? Where else would you go? It's kind of obvious. Entertainment. Entertainment. That's number one in my mind. Entertainment. Cut back on eating out so much. That'll bury you, by the way. Eating out. We walked down here last night. I'm so frustrated, both of us. You know, um, we walked down here to this bubble gum place, and I got a hamburger, and she got some tilapia, and it was $50. I like to fell out of my chair. You know, just a hamburger and a little bit of fish, you know, and some iced tea in a loud, noisy place, you know. And, uh, and I thought, oh my goodness, we really blew it this time. So this morning, we went over to the Log Cabin restaurant, and we're both over 60, so we got the senior breakfast, which included coffee, for $7.65 each, plus four little pancakes, and, and the um, bacon that goes with it, and the egg, and everything, and all the coffee you can drink, you know, for, for under $15, you know? And then another place we like to go is McAllister's. I like to go to McAllister because you get a, you know you get a you can get a, a soup and a sandwich and a drink and eat that at a reasonable cost and there's no tip, right? It's because you're you're serving yourself up the front, so you save money by not paying a tip. So anyway, um, and get the price down. So there are ways to to do this. Some of you use coupons, right? Your coupon clippers. My daughter has a big book. She goes in the grocery store and she flips this book open. Boy, the people are irritated behind her. But she is saving so much money to put in an investment account. Just disciplined. She's just bulldog disciplined. So that's right. And so then you want to have money to put in savings and investments. But you cannot sleep at night if your budget's out of balance. Somebody's not sleeping. If you're the spender, you really don't care. But the person who's saving and keeping the books, they're the ones up all night nervous about the thing. And that's not good in a marriage. It should be together, communicated together. Keep her happy, keep it in balance, and keep funds available so that you can save and, and prepare for the future. Um, I could walk out that door right now and retire, just, and I've been that way for several years and not work anymore, um, and just enjoy, but I love what I'm doing. <laughs> so I just, I said, well, they pay me to do this. You know, I love what I'm doing, uh, but I'm not bound by it. Don't let finances be the crushing yoke on top of your head that just destroys your home and marriage. And the way you get control of it is by, gentlemen, unfortunately, the details of it. You've got to pencil it out or put it in the computer so that you can get control of it. And once it's on paper, my father taught me this at age 35, he's worth about $25 million. He came off the farm as a young boy, a number three path in a wash tub, and went, and went to the Marine Corps, then the University of Miami in Engineering, and built his own corporations. And he said, son, remember, he was a mathematician. He said, everything's in the math. Put it in the spreadsheet. Get away from the emotion. Mistakes are going to be made in the emotion. Get to the mathematics and make it balance. Make the math work. And I can always remember that in my mind. It's in heaven now, a few years now. Love my dad. We're about 20 years apart. So we look like brothers there towards the end of his life um, as he lived there in Florida. But he ran five corporations at the end. The other, he had 100 offices in 13 states. In his 30s, he was just a workaholic. You ever made anybody come off a farm? They learned how to work, you know? And he just worked and worked and worked. And, but he taught us the discipline of that, how to love and prepare and care for our family. And he loved pastors and he loved missionaries and enjoyed helping them and taking care of them and being a part of uh, helping them in their lives. But the key is managing it and doing the math. So if you'll do this and then periodically review it, Set an appointment. Sometimes we do it over the dinner table in, our, in a restaurant, and I'll grab a napkin, and I'll pencil out assets, liabilities, net worth, and this, and this, and this, and hand it. We'll talk about it, go back and forth. It should be a regular communication kind of thing. See how big this is in your life? You know, living in this world, money's going to touch everything in your life, practically. It can't buy you eternity. God's done all of that for you. But everything costs money. The glasses you wear, the clothes you wear, the shoes you wear, the car you drive, the house you live in, the, the food you consume, 
Every single thing has a monetary component. So why wouldn't you take the time to pencil out a budget and communicate that with one another? Something so important like that. You wonder why the number one cause of divorce in the United States is finance. Because the couples are not doing that, can't live together. It's a hard experience. It's a terrible experience. You've been on the counseling end of that. So what you do is just simply make an agreement, write it out. And then, then if you'll take this booklet once again, you know, just in case you might be in a little financial trouble, flip to the next page. And there's a snowball strategy. This is the way to liquidate debt. Debt's your enemy. Okay? So get rid of it. And you can snowball strategy your way in a budget to liquidate your debt. Pick that payment, that highest payment, start knocking that thing out, get it paid off, and then you keep rolling those excess funds into the next one, the next one, the next one. And you write it down, get it out of here, you know, out of your head, put it on paper so you both can attack it together and knock it out. And uh, then if you flip to the next page, you can see a monthly spending plan. Here's some tips for these impulse uh, spenders. I would say for the next 30 days, here's a challenge for you. For the next 30 days, write down every dime you spend every day for the next 30 days on a ledger. Write it down. How much you spend for every single thing. I have the students do this in college. And it's amazing when they come back and show me what they're spending and how it helps them. When you write it all down, you can see it. Then you can make a change and do something about it. So for 30 days, here's another thing for an impulse buyer. Wait 30 days. Wait. Just back off of it. Take a deep breath. And usually within 30 days, it's gone. Whatever that was is gone. Okay? See, unfortunately, in our society, we're programmed by the television and commercials. You know, subconscious, you know, subliminal. So you have to spend and you have to keep up with so-and-so and such and such. That's baloney. Okay? <laughs> Just keep the Lord first. Right? And he'll bless you and live within the framework of God's blessing over the resources you have and manage your way through it. I guarantee you, when was the last time you were in church, you know, like I said, you wanted to give something to somebody? I can remember being in, in church um, and a missionary came from Africa. And this missionary had built 21 churches in the country of Africa. And they came to the end of the road and came to the woods where you couldn't drive any further, and all of a sudden, all these children, teenagers came out, and they had babies who were carrying babies on their hips. These teenagers were coming out of the woods in Africa. Their parents had died of AIDS, okay? So here's the children raising their siblings, and they came out of the woods. And the missionaries saw this for the first time. And um, these missionaries that were over there had blonde hair, blue eyes, very fair skin, and in the deepest parts of Africa, the children even come and touch them on their face. They'd never seen anything like that before. And they would come. And he came to that place. So he came to our church. And I was one of the, I was the treasurer, one of the deacons there. And he presented this to us. And he said, folks, he said, I need to buy medicine for these children to stop this disease. I need to feed them, build a feeding station. We need to dig a well. They had to go down 2,000 feet to drill that well. They brought a UK engineer over and drilled that well down, got fresh water for them. Got a feeding station and a teaching station, a training station, and then he took his missionary support part of it and bought medicine to retard to stop that disease in these children. It wasn't their fault; it just it happened in their families. And so here he is presenting to the church, and he needs about thirty-five thousand dollars, you know, to go do something with this. And so the whole congregation were just, and we kept surpluses when I was running the budget there, and it still is to this day. And they were able to take those surpluses and invest them into that missionary and meet that need. I remember one more occasion as I was um, in, in a service and wanting to um, give to the Lord's work. I'm just checking my time here to make sure we're okay, we're good. Um, and I was sitting up in the choir. Have you ever been like that? The missionary's up there speaking and the Lord speaks to you inside. And you have a figure in your mind the Lord has a different one. <laughs> and he wants you to write that check and stretch and do something and give. And you've budgeted, so you've got these resources available in, in reserves. And so I thought, I'll do it. You know, when you get over the flesh, because it's fighting against you, and the Spirit of God is speaking to you, and you just write it out, and you put it in the plate. Well, I did that one Sunday at Blush County Baptist Church. I served there with Pastor John Reynolds for a number of years. We went from four families to 1,500 people in about a 20-year period of time, and just the church grew beautifully. 
And I did that. Well, it was two weeks later. And God can do this sometimes. He can give a blessing sometimes back to the giver. Matter of fact, it says, Give it shall be given unto you, good measure, shaken down, pressed together, and running over. And if you manage a budget, you'll experience these kind of things. And so I'm sitting there, and I go into work, and suddenly I get a phone call to go down to the tower. Anybody been to Disney World in Orlando in that area? The tallest building downtown is the SunTrust Tower. And I work for that company, and so I got a call from one of the execs, and he said, I want you to come to my office and meet with you this Friday. So I'm sitting across from him, his desk in the tower, and he looks at me and he said, I've got a check for you here, and I want to give this to you. No strings attached to it. And I just, I think you and your family need this, I want to give it to you. I'm in the corporate world now, this doesn't happen. And it was 10 times the amount I had given to that missionary. 10 times. And I just, I just sat back in my seat. And I just couldn't believe it. I said, the Lord did that. I didn't ask for that. I didn't expect that. And I got home, and she was excited. And I told her about that. And the, the sailor was always excited, you know. <laughs> the spender's thinking about, oh, we're going to do this. You know, the sailor's like, oh, let's put this in the bank. You know, and so anyway, I went to the bank to an investment account. But if you plan your budget and start where you are, don't give up. Just start where you are and pencil it out slowly and carefully and try it. You know, and you'll, you'll be amazed. Now, I'm speaking to somebody with 40 years I've been doing this. <laughs> For 40 years, and I've watched the blessings of the Lord over and over. I can't even count them anymore. I'll just have to wait to the other side. I serve a pastor. They're much the same like that. We will never know until we get to the other side the blessings and the things that God has used you as a steward to invest as a family in the ministry for the gospel's sake for your children and family. And I've got, we've got some extra time here, so I'm going to open it up for some questions. We have about um, 10 minutes before the next session starts. So any questions at all, I'll be glad to answer those. Yes, sir? Um, you mentioned your wife used an app. Is there an app? Or yes, there's an app. On the back of this document, there's some websites, and you can download some tools from that, and uh, that will be of help to you. Yes, sir. Well, I see them changing because taxes are going up, energy's going down, um, but there's still plenty of room to invest in the market. Now, I use Guidestone and I use Timothy Plan. TimothyPlan.com and Guidestone.org because they filter out the sin stocks. I just don't invest in anything. They have a software that filters the sin stocks out. What I mean is companies invest in pornography, they invest in abortion, they invest in all kinds of things. You don't know that. Johnson Johnson's heavily invested in abortion things, okay? It's in their financial statement. So they filter that and they show me where to put the investments. Yes? Can you repeat those questions? Yeah, timothyplan.com, timothyplan.com, and guidestone.org. Those are the two ones that I use. 20% returns last year in the market, in the mutual fund market. And the sin stocks were weeded out. I got a great conviction about this years ago as a banker because I just put money in 401ks and set it aside in investments. And I didn't really look. You know, I looked at the returns, but not the company. And I found that I was putting the pastor's money, you know, he's preaching the gospel, and here his money's going into things that are totally against the Bible. So we flipped that whole thing around, and I got training and education in that area. Very few people have that. And but guidestone.org and timothyplan.com are the two I steer you towards. Still get good returns, but you're not investing in sinful things that were against the Bible. Any other questions? I need to let you go to the next seminar. I'd like to close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this great host of people. I pray you bless them, Lord. Take your word and may it be sealed in their hearts and uh, help them all to be expert budgeting people. Husbands and wives talking and communicating and helping one another, and encouraging one another, and making things in harmony, and, and the gospel and your word being going forward with, with investment, Lord. Bless them and help them be great stewards, for it's in Jesus' name we pray.